to the second half of the interview with Maya Washington and Tarana Harris Mays as we continue our celebration of diversity in honor of Black History Month. If you missed the first half, please go back and check it out. Otherwise, stick around and we'll pick up where we left off. Friends and family, welcome back. In our last episode, we learned a lot about the dual legacies of Gene Washington and Chick Harris, two pioneers in the integration of football at the collegiate and NFL level. And, you know, I think further about the datage, which is the basis for this series that we're doing right now. And the datage is commitment to diversity opens many doors, sometimes doors you didn't even know were closed. And as I listened to some of these impact stories and how so much was being changed by these players on the field. I take a step back and I listen, though, to the stories of your fathers and that they were, you know, living their lives. They were pursuing their dreams and they may not have even known at the time that they were making history. Do you both think that there was a moment along the way for your fathers where they actually had a realization? And when the two of you had a realization of the impact that they were having on changing the face of sports and and changing the minds of the world. Maya, in particular, I loved what you said in an interview of yours that I heard where you said you realized history is in your own household. Uh, Tell us about that realization for you and, and when you think that realization hit your father as well along his career. Well, I think for sure, I don't know that in my interviews and time with them that any of them thought of themselves in terms of being historical, but it was definitely don't mess up. (laughs) Do not mess it up. Do not mess this up. And the community and the brotherhood that they had, you know, if they had a teammate who the first time it snowed and, you know, was getting homesick or, or struggling in their, what my dad refers to as their studies is how my dad talks about schoolwork in their studies. They would, you know, rally to, to support that person because the consequences of this experiment not working, you're going back to the segregated South. You're going back to limited opportunities, limited paths for yourself. So the stakes were so high that at least they knew that much. But I definitely think for me, the turning point really was around 2011 when Bubba Smith passed. I'm hearing some of these stories. My dad was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. And in some of the preparations that the Hall of Fame put together in announcing his bio and things like that, that I started to recognize, wait a minute, history's in my household. So I was never really that interested in football, but wait a minute, you were a first round draft pick in 1967. And do you understand what that means? And within the context of this historical narrative, you know, like the geek in me starts coming out and drawing these connections and understanding that I have been very passionate about the civil rights movement and those heroes who had the courage to do what needed to be done. And I think there were so many people and in a lot of African-American households and households of all ethnic backgrounds, someone in your family was the first to do something, first to get a job at the local uh, library, first to be a mail carrier, first to have their own insurance company on whatever the main street is in downtown Main Street, USA, where you live. And usually when we're doing this, like when I became obsessed with this, yes, I'm underrepresented in my field as an indie filmmaker, you know, but here I am a a five foot two little brown woman making a football movie. And I made my own history in in ways, right? And Tarana's uh, work is, is doing that and has been doing that. So I really feel like that's the most empowering thing I can impart is that there is history in your own household. And to to Tarana's point and to what you brought up, Chad, about reclaiming our narratives, I think uh, a lot of times in media, and I can kind of broadly paint this as a Hollywood stroke, uh, there's these stories and you want to option someone else's story and tell some, you know, I'm going to, this important African-American story. And it's like, 
well, maybe you could just tell your own African-American story. Maybe you could actually uh, investigate your own life and see what's interesting about it and maybe let someone who's more appropriate take on the biopic about that person, if that makes sense. And so I really think we're all far more interesting than we realize. And I think looking elsewhere for a great story sometimes makes that story not as great because you're not able to to take hold of it the way that you are your own stories, your own way of looking at something from your lived experience is is what I'd say. Tarana, do you think your dad realized he was uh, living a story worth telling? Or do you think he was just suffering from that same don't mess this up mindset? Oh, they definitely had the don't mess this up mindset. They feel definitely they had to be twice and three times as good for sure. I don't think they, I think that's what's so compelling to me about their stories. I think they were just pursuing their dream yeah. and being as excellent as they could. And of course that generation was tasked with bringing others along with them. I don't think he, aside from being, you know, the only or maybe one of two, actually, sometimes he was the only black uh, person in the entire athletic department or uh, the entire, you know, an entire team. But I don't think he just went to work every day trying to make his team better. And I think that's the lessons in their stories. And what came along with it was incredible. Because then, you know, for me, the moment that I realized what they had done or what my dad was a part of was when the Rooney rule was passed in 2002. And I was a journalist at ABC News. And I went, Oh, this is what they were inside the organization pushing for. And unfortunately, that moment is really ascribed to a few people. Yeah. But it was a group and a body and a brotherhood, if you'd like to say, of men who had supported each other throughout the years to get to that point and who are still mentoring the young coaches hoping to have a shot. So, yeah, I don't think he knew that he, he was just trying to make his players feel special feel loved and pouring into them so they could reach their highest potential. And if this is what you get, this beautiful moment we're having, this inclusive moment we're having in sports mm -hmm. by pouring in individual by individual, they have done their jobs as coaches. It took a lot of time and a lot of small steps along the way to see the big changes at this time. And Maya, similarly to impact that Chick Harris has had in making massive change in the business of the NFL, your dad's legacy of being a pioneer for diversity didn't end on the football field. You said, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, that you knew him in your lifetime more as a suit and tie guy versus a helmet and shoulder pads guy. Gene obviously went on to make a major impact as a champion for diversity in the corporate world as well. Isn't that right? Yes, I think that was always what was handed down to me. Tarana spoke to that, you know, you got to work harder, run faster. <laughs> you know, you, you can never let them see you sweat. That adage is sort of what was instilled in me and my siblings. We knew that my parents came from a segregated environment. We knew how important it was that when someone opens a door for you, you hold it, open it even wider than it was for you. And so both of my parents kind of carved out a lane that was just sort of, um, I guess, the result of, again, like legislation and ways that the country was saying, you know, affirmative action is sort of how we, you know, talk about it modern day, which now it has some weight to it when people say affirmative action. But that was groundbreaking in the late 60s and early 70s when my parents were pursuing their careers, both went on to get uh, master's degrees and ended up in corporate human resources. And so the stories from their lives are so many people of so many different cultures and experiences and marginalized identities who say, I made it as an engineer because Gene Washington did a college career fair and I brought my resume and I talked to him. And next thing you know, I'm off to some internship or some opportunity. And my dad's kind of biggest commitment to the corporate world at one organization was 3M Corporation. And so he made significant significant change in the spaces in engineering specifically and tech careers for people of color, for women, people of other marginalized identities. Uh, my dad was at their conference, SHIP, Mashimba, Nesby, NACME, ASIS, all of these organizations for diverse people who are pursuing STEM careers 
this was the world my dad, I, that was his his football field. That was his track and his passion and enthusiasm for connecting people with opportunity. It exists now, even in his retirement. Uh, one of our family friends is interviewing for a position and uh, asked my dad for his two cents. And, you know, he's kind of, <laughs> you know, always the guy who's sending somebody's resume around or, or trying to make those connections. And same with my mother. There are people who, women engineers who, because my mother made it possible for them to get their work visa and a great hiring opportunity, you know, went on to be very, very successful as women engineers in the 80s and 90s, a time when uh, women in STEM, as we still need more women in STEM to this day, we really needed women in STEM in the 80s and 90s. And so that has to come from the doors that were open for my parents when they were young people, that that's what they chose to do with their life after college, after football to this day. If they can help somebody, uh, they, they're on top of it. They're excited about people's success. Can I say something, Chad? I'm so sorry. Do you mind? Because I think you're hitting on something really important, Maya. This moment that we're having with women in sports, yes, it comes from Title IX. But a lot of the foundations, the edifice around which women are able to walk through the doors, the conditioning that these institutions had to endure in order to get to this moment where we're celebrating women coaches and what women are doing in football specifically, that's what I'm studying. But of course, these all have roots going back to our dad's generation, making the sacrifice. Women are having a moment because some of these men open doors for them and they would want, they wanted that for me as their daughter and they wanted that for all people. And so the Rooney rule is a model in so many different industries. I mean, and certainly there's pros and cons, but the Mansfield rule, the uh, the Russell rule, a lot of these things that we are now looking to as models came out of this problem in sports where the revenue generating, you know, workforce was majority black and the leadership was not so black. <laughs> and we had to figure out a way to make opportunity. Women are benefiting from that. And so I think if women in sports is a popular topic, let's talk about how these trailblazers help make some of those moments possible. Yeah. And Toronto, you've shared with me before in conversation how the doors that your father opened as a champion of diversity in the world of sports have had parallels for you in your own career and the doors that you've seen opening for you in a completely different field. Can you share with uh, the friends and family some of, of that perspective? Yes. I mean, I think that's what, you know, I thought, oh, I, I don't really have a dad who does something I can do because back then, you know, women were not on the sidelines as coaches as they are now. They were not in the president's office as Sandra Douglas Morgan is. If they had been, I would have gone to spend a lot of time with them when I was running around in front offices. But I think you're going to have to pull this up, Chad, because now I just lost my train of thought. Uh, we were talking about... So let's pause for a moment just to clear the sound space. I'll remind you of, of what I, I had mentioned earlier. That I, was... My mind went to 1983. Sorry. <laughs> The question specifically was about, you've made comments to me before about oh. how your dad opening doors is now a model for opening doors for you in your career. Yes, because of what I watched my dad do and when I realized what he was doing was special, I knew how to, there were always these subtle lessons, like you have to be three times better. You can never give him a reason to doubt you. You know, you have to be able to stand up for yourself and believe you have a reason to be there. There were all these subtle lessons that weren't explicitly about race, but I just absorbed them as a woman, as a woman of color, so that when I stepped in the rooms of network news and I was one of the only, I just kind of knew how to, you know, operate in those spaces. And so even when I look today trying to direct a film about football, I really am encouraged by these men who give me their dadages about um, success and how success comes that's irrespective of race. Patience plus persistence equals success and all these different things that they teach their players. They're, they've poured into me. And so yeah, I look at what they did and I say, if they did it, I can do it. And um, I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be tenacious. And that's all things that were just absorbed over my lifetime of watching my dad, you know, lead the way he did. For sure. 
Uh, Maya, anything to add on, on that topic? No, I just, I'm enjoying getting to know so much about you, Tarana, and, and your dad. I think this is so, so fantastic and so amazing. And I just really appreciate getting insight into your experience. And it's, um, you know, I don't want to be too hokey and say there's this sisterhood, but there is. There, there's, there are these other people who've had similar, if not parallel lives or experiences. And it's remarkable to to be connected to such a rich history, but to see how it reverberates in different ways all around the country to be sort of the offspring a first, you know, <laughs> someone who was the first to go to college or the first to leave the hometown or, or whatever that looks like in, in our respective lives. I just think it's it's unbelievable. And I'm I'm grateful. I'm grateful our dads did not mess it up. I'll just say that much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just grateful. They did not at all. They did not mess it up. And I'm here with you because they didn't mess it up. <laughs> well, both of you are doing way better than messing it up. I, I mean, uh, let's shift the focus a little bit more to the two of you, because I love that your stories have layers. I'm a, I'm a layers guy. I love layers. And what I mean by the layers that I see when I think about your story is that you're not only paying tribute to your fathers by telling these stories, that's kind of layer one, but you're also carrying on their legacy to the next generation and to a broader audience who may not know these stories by telling their stories. So that's layer two. And then on top of that, by pioneering within your own fields as uh, women of color, who are taking a leadership role. And as we said, telling these narratives, taking back the narratives, you're paving the way for greater diversity and being champions within your own industries, which is layer three. Do either of you ever take a step back and consider those layers and those, those ramifications and the implications and the impact that you're having? I'll let Tarana go first. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I really just want to tell this story. And if it inspires another young woman, you know, my daughters are watching me every day make this movie. They see me every day trying to work hard and use my resources and not give up. And if I could just make an impact on those little girls who are going to play flag football, um, then I have done my job the way my dad has done his job for me. And I take calls all the time from young women in production, and I will encourage them that you can do it. I will take any call. And that's um, my dad would take any call from black or white you know, player wanting to be better. And so he instilled that in me to give back. And um, again, I'm, I just hope that their stories get told to a wider audience than just us. And that that will be my price. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to pose a very direct question. And Maya, maybe you can provide your perspective and Tron, I'd like to hear yours as well. In your professional lives, uh, working within your industry as women of color, do you find today that you face more bias in your career on the basis of race or on the basis of your gender? I think that's a really good question. I think the jury's out for me. I was fortunate at the time that uh, Through the Banks of the Red Cedar came out to the film festival circuit in 2018 when we kind of debuted. And again, this is after starting this in 2011. So that gives you a sense of just how long it took me to get to the festival premiere. Uh, we aired on the Big Ten Network in 2020. Our semi-permanent home right now is PBS, and that happened in 2022. Uh, my book came out in 2022. I feel I had a lot of representation as a young woman of women who wrote books, so that was helpful. But my journey as a director and somebody who works in film, I started as an actress. And this step in this direction was I recognized instead of waiting around for work to find me, I need to create opportunities for myself. I can't wait to tell these great stories until someone pays attention to me. I, I got to go after this story. And I have a hunch that other people are going to care about this story because it's important. But as an artist, I think philosophically, I try to follow what actually is of interest to me intuitively. What are the stories that I'm obsessed with? And I love Tarana's story, the two stories, one about you being sort of the only one, whatever that was, you know, the only you in the room in your career and what that was for your father. And so there are so many times 
where doors have opened for me and I was ready. I rose to the occasion. And in the moment, so one example I have is I directed an episode of a series called I was there for the History Channel. And on set, we are reenacting the life story of John Lewis. And so we have a full <laughs> extras, the whole nine yards. We are reenacting Selma, okay? <laughs> and I am conducting this. We've got stunts. We've got extras. It's a period piece. It's a historical period piece. That's important. And in those moments, I'm like, okay, besides our actors, I'm the only black person <laughs> in this scenario. I'm the only woman on the crew who's not in hair and makeup and wardrobe. Or I think we had a woman who was the uh, COVID deputy, the person who was making sure we took our COVID tests. And we had an executive producer and showrunner who was a woman. But in that context, of being a woman director doing episodic television or in that other world outside of my indie experience, I'm it. <laughs> and I don't feel it until I take a moment and be like, yeah, I am the only, you know, I've had um, makeup artists as I'm, you know, talking to another makeup artist about the look or whatever. I had one makeup artist who was like, well, who, who are you? <laughs> I'm your director. I'm the director. <laughs> um, so I think fortunately, when my film came out, there were all these amazing groups for women filmmakers. There's a, a group called Film Fatals. There's a group called um, Brown Girls Doc Mafia for the for the documentary girls. Um, both organizations are international. So there is a movement of women supporting women in our field and doing amazing things. But even within that fabric of of the sisterhood, there is a unique experience of being a Black woman, being a woman of color, and recognizing that uh, Tarana's story is different than my story, even though we have so many similarities. Her life as a biracial person, and I'm not sure if that's how you identify, but having you have a unique way that you experience the world. I am Black on both sides. And my mom's heritage is Creole. So I come from a mixed race <laughs> identity and heritage. And this is the way that I look in the world and move through life from a unique perspective. And I think the industry is aware that women can tell a variety of stories and generally speaking, can tell women's stories. But when it you dial down deeper to ethnicity, to culture, to race. We actually are not uh, a monolith, as as people say, but we're not. Um, I have a very different take on uh, growing up uh, than possibly Tirana has, even though we have uh, intersections there. So perhaps that's the next frontier where we get to see more diversity from the African-American experience. And I just hope women, I, we got to stay in here. We got to stay in media, even if it's driving us bananas and doing everything it can to drive us away. Um, we have contributions to make and a way of seeing the world that is really important. Tarana, we you know we talked about Maya was very much speaking about the diverse identity that you uh, represent. Where do you see the greatest challenges uh, within your field? Uh, I think well, I think leadership comes from anywhere, and that's definitely a theme in my film. That I hope the you know we will be able to see how that plays out. I think you know there's there's a lot of challenges to making a film. And whether you're that transcend race, it's just hard. And the ones who stick with it are the ones who get get their film seen. I do think that they are executives. The statistics are what the statistics are about executives in Hollywood. I think that it just takes you and you may have to knock. I may have to knock on 10 more doors than the next person, but that's incumbent on me if I have something to say. So if I believe in myself and my craft, I believe that I will break through. And that's all you can do. And that's all the participants of my film ever did at, to the tune of 40 years, some of them in the NFL. So I'm still using that as my inspiration. And uh, yes, I think that there's a lot of things I would like to say in a case study about my film in terms of pitching and getting into rooms. I think that this is a very risk averse industry and we're very, we are at a very 
dangerous time uh, in this consolidation of media and whose stories are getting told in the same stories unfortunately get told all the time because they're safe. I like to say my job is to shake the coaching trees to make new stories fall out versus those told over and over again. And I came come back every day when I get up and do this <laughs> to the story of Mike Tomlin and the story of the Rooney Rule and the story of the fact that the Rooney family took a chance and now we have one of the winniest football coaches in the NFL. I think that that is yeah. encouraging to me and I just and my faith in God also pulls me through of course of course and we've talked already about the important work you're both doing carrying on your family legacy and let's talk about that the family side of it for a moment and what the next generation looks like uh Tarana you have daughters how do you pass along these important messages to them in a way that resonates with them at their age and what do you hope that they will learn by example from you? Uh, well, both my daughters have their individual interests. Uh, one is more inclined toward athletics than the other. But like I say, and they're they're both excellent athletes, but like I and my dad has coached them in football in our backyard on many occasions. Uh, but like I say, I just want them to see hard work. It takes hard work. And I just love the different, if I can be one of those women who can get her thing made so that the next woman believes she can get her thing made, then then we've won. So that's just what I, I hope uh, for my daughters is that they see you can work hard at something and get it done. I always tell my boys that uh, you work hard to earn the right to continue to work harder the next day. I like that. That's one of the Hegel family values. And, yeah. And uh, hey, that's beautiful, Chad. And, that's and, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you. And Maya, as an, an author and an educator, you're obviously spending a lot of your time investing in the next generation as well. Can you share with us some more about what you're doing to pay it forward and, and tell us what you're seeing from this generation coming up and what gives you hope for continued progress? That's a big question. For me, I just, I think everything Tarana said is we have to give young people, even in this insane time that we are living in, uh, where it would be very easy to dwell in the statistics of, of what's not going right and point to where we're seeing all of the things that are not going right on social media, on television and things like that. And for me, working with young people helps me remember, like, there are people in the future. <laughs> there are people of diverse experiences. There are people like us who want everybody to win and who embrace um, all of the different differences and, and things that make us unique. And uh, with the film and the book being out in the world and PBS being such a great educational space, there's curriculum now to go with the book, to go with the film. I have a online uh, do-it-yourself class that young people can take to learn how to tell their own stories so they can do an inspired by a true story workshop with me. It's an asynchronous, asynchronous online class that they can take. And uh, we have free digital, you know, downloads that people can use in their book clubs and their affinity groups. And it's been amazing to see that as interesting as the landscape is that we are all discussing and mentioning like what media is and what Hollywood is and, and all of that. But there is an audience of people like us who just want to have these types of conversations, who want to dig deep into their own lives and, and find meaning in their families and share those important stories in, in their family. And overall, the feedback uh, it makes me kind of emotional it has just been so warm and supportive. And I hope if this hasn't already started for you, Tarana, get ready for it because uh, people who encountered my parents at different stages in life, find me and send me emails and tell me more stories about them that either they forgot or didn't know that someone had that experience or perception of them. So I get stories of, I met your dad once at, you know, the cafeteria and, and tell me some amazing stories. Or your mother and I used to, you know, go to the grocery store every Tuesday or, or these amazing anecdotal moments where I get a, a richer understanding of my own history, but make these genuine connections with 
people whose history is in their own household, you know, who have these extraordinary stories and, and lives. And I hope when I'm in my late seventies, like my parents, I have some good stories and that most people who encountered me had positive experiences. That, that's as good as it, it gets. And I just am obsessed with telling people whatever you have, if it's an iPhone, an Android, sit your elders down and just ask them questions about their life. Have these conversations, find this the, the family albums, if there's footage or audio, and don't be shy if, you know, the teens, tweens, and 20-somethings are just like, why are you telling me all this? Well, be, you're going to care. So I'm going to tell you this. And if if they are wanting to know those stories from you, uh, be vulnerable enough. Tell them about the town where you grew up because we take for granted how quickly things have changed. We are in a virtual studio <laughs> recording a podcast. It's funny. That I remember pay phones. I remember the cards that you use. Like, I remember long distance being expensive, you know, and if you wanted to talk to relatives, hurry up, it's long distance. You know, <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't just talk to grandma as long as you want or FaceTime her, you know, on, on your phone. That's remarkable. Toronto, do you have something you want to add there? Yeah, no, I was just thinking that we say storytelling. Yeah. But what I found is that the very the joy I get out of my craft is listening. Yeah. And that is the gift we can give others is to listen to them, whether you're in the industry or not. Listen to each other. Chad, thank you so much for listening to us today. Well, I'm I'm um, trying to develop listening as my own superpower. So you're helping well, me practice this and I'm really enjoying it. Thank you for listening to us. And I'll, I'll, I'll give another um, example of just like, if you can see it, you can be it, which is the real powerful message, no matter who you are. But my, one of the things that I love to hear in the course of the film was that there was a coach, uh, Ted Williams, who saw my dad in his career and said, I, I really like to coach football. And my dad helped him. And I said, well, this is what you can do. If you can see it, you can be it. Well, Ted Williams' son is now on the staff. I believe he's still on the staff of the team that just won the Super Bowl. Wow. So his dad saw someone doing what he wanted to do. Then his son saw something, his dad do something he wanted to do. And that's the power of these stories and, and the power of what you're doing, Chad, by giving us this time. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both. And I, as we're wrapping up here today, I want to bring it back to something personal. And it's about the power of, I, I'm going to say story creating, because it's a collaborative process, right? It's a way of bringing people together. And these aren't my words. I'm actually going to read from your book, Maya, because this is a passage that I really, really touched me personally as a dad when, when I read it. And I, I will tear up here, I promise, uh, in trying to read it uh, now. In the past few years, my dad and I have spent more time together than we have since my early childhood. It feels like we've been granted a kind of do-over. I may not have been a track star, but the need to run away from anything and everything related to my dad's connection to sports somehow came back full circle. I relish every new story about his youth and every new factoid about TV timeouts and the new tournament structure for the college football playoffs. As I said, as a dad, to me, that is the most valuable element of all of this, that even though we've been talking throughout this entire episode about societal impacts and diversity and integration and all of these things, at the end of the day, the diversity that exists within your own family and being able to reach across generations and connect with one another, I think that's what's really beautiful about what both of you are doing and, and paying tribute to your fathers and engaging with them in this process. And Tarana, you, uh, I don't know if you're aware, did, did you know your dad has a LinkedIn page? <laughs> I don't want to know where that came from, so, uh, but thank you for giving me another to-do uh, thing. Oh, my. He does, and it says one thing on it. His job description is retired and enjoying time to pursue personal interests and family. I thought that was amazing. Awesome. I didn't know that. Now you're going to make me tear up because I also am enjoying a lot of time with my dad. He lives nine miles from me now. And it's just beautiful that we still have this time. And yes, 
Well, you described you your dad that. as your, your life coach and that you've really been, as you said, spending a lot of time with him in retirement versus the time you had with him during his lengthy professional coaching career. Uh, I'd love to have you share a little bit more about that before we wrap up today. Yeah, that's right. I mean, my dad missed a lot of track meets. He missed a lot of things because he was working. But as a, an adult, I now understand the value of doing your dream. And I don't I don't hold that against him in any way, shape or form. But it's just really precious as I become to take care of him now in life and to take care of him his memories. It's become even more important that that I just listen and give him what he needs. And that, that, that fulfills the girl in me for sure. But we do have a lot more time together to absorb the memories he has, to laugh and just just be together. And I'm so grateful that his career did end when it did uh, because he's still able to enjoy that life. And he is my life coach um, and, my, and my life is better for it. So uh, Maya, you have the book, which I got on Amazon, the documentary. How can members of the friends and family find the documentary and how can they keep up with you? Yeah, so All Things Through the Banks of the Red Cedar is the name of the book and film. If you forget that long title, you can always just look up Gene Washington movie <laughs> or film Maya Washington. And I do hope people uh, find their way to our story and I hope it inspires you to find those pioneering stories in your own life. Amazing. And Tarana, I understand that you're right on the precipice of being able to announce an exciting new project. How do the members of the Datages friends and family keep track of what you're up to and know when that happens? Just keep hoping, just keep praying. I will continue to tell little bits of my story on LinkedIn, which I hope gives people a point and access to my point of view and why it's important in this time of women telling stories about sports. So maybe we could do another episode when, when we can fully announce what we've got going on. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hold you to that. Now you've done it. Well, we definitely yes. will have you come back and we'd love to keep up with you and, and we'd love to showcase the project when it releases. I think it's, it'd be awesome. Thank you. And you. we talked about, you know, building a community here. And I really hope now that the two of you are officially members of the Datages friends and family, it would be amazing to me to hear stories in the future about the two of you teaming up and collaborating and the amazing things you could do together. Thank you, Chad, for creating this community. I absolutely cannot wait to call you, Maya, um, and compare stories and even just get some tips from your own journey. Read your book, watch your film, and just find fellowship, which is, which is so important to be supported and have fun along the way. I will be calling you. <laughs> Good. And I will be waiting for that call. I mean, this is just an example of the I, you can't describe it until you see it, Chad, like this just happened, you know, that, that there yeah, are, yeah. that we have lived these separate lives. And I held back, I didn't say anything about the little USC dig, but I'm a Trojan <laughs> about the, about the recruit, but, I, but I'm glad you were born. And um, it's okay that it's okay that USC kind of, you know, didn't have the day they, they should have because you were born. But well, this, well, USC <laughs> is a very important part of the history, so we can get there later. But <laughs> yes, I am but, grateful for that, USC. <laughs> um, but this is amazing. And we'll keep the uh, Stanford-USC rivalry going here for a moment, because uh, one of the things that we hold out here at Datages is the legacy of the bad dad joke or bad parent <laughs> joke, as the case may be. And so I'm going to give you two the opportunity to share dueling dad jokes. <laughs> uh, Maya, as the visiting Trojan, uh, I'll let you go first. All right. Here we go. I got this one from my dad. Okay. I am really good, really good at sleeping. And I'm so good at sleeping that I can do it with my eyes closed. Amazing. That is talent for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Rana, she set a high bar for you. You're going to be able to eclipse that? Oh, that was perfect, actually. Because how does a man cut his hair, Chad? I wouldn't know. <laughs> He eclipse, he eclipse it. Ah. Uh, <laughs> that is, I think that's pretty dad. I think that's a pretty good dad joke right there. Maybe yeah. not good, but definitely a dad joke. That was awesome. Got it. Got it. 
That was awesome. You queued me up for that one. Well, ladies, this has been a lot of fun and very informative, very meaningful discussion as well. I'm glad we were were able to end on a very light note, but I know we covered some very important topics today. And I thank you both again for your time, for sharing your stories, for being with us. It was it was really an amazing experience for me and it's brought a lot to my life. And I appreciate both of you being here. Thank you for your generosity, Chad. This is so fun. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And welcome to the Data Just Friends and Family. We really appreciate you being part of the group and part of the community. I'll remind the rest of the Data Just Friends and Family that until next time, Dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does.